I have attended three film festivals in the last six-ish months. Fantastic Fest, Sundance, and now South by Southwest. And seasoned veterans might think light work, but I'm new to this. I'm exhausted. <laughs> but part of that exhaustion is how social and exciting these festivals are. I feel so lucky to have gone to my first South by Southwest. I got to be in person with both of my podcast co-hosts, which was magical. South by Southwest also has more genre stuff that's really up my alley, so that was a lot of fun and it was just epic. I, I loved it. Today we're going to be going through my top 10 of the festival. I saw 16 movies in total, so there aren't too many that are going to be excluded from this, but if you have questions about any of the ones that didn't make my top 10, feel free to leave a comment. I'm also going to be reviewing them on Letterboxd, especially because some of these are really highly anticipated films that I didn't like as much as I wanted to. It was heartbreaking, especially these two highly anticipated horror films, Immaculate and Cuckoo. Like, what's gotten into me? I was expecting to love both of these, and I didn't didn't hate them by any means, but they just didn't quite do it for me. Cuckoo especially though, I would really like to give a second chance. It was the last film that I saw at the fest and I was just totally spent at that point. So if you're intrigued by it, totally check it out. Probably the biggest thing I took away from that film is that Hunter Schaefer is so good and she needs to be put in everything. And for Cuckoo, they handed out these big newspapers. So cool. And Roadhouse, Cue Family Guy clip. Roadhouse. 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 It was really fun as the opening night film. It's streaming on Prime now, and I actually liked it. It's just not in my top 10. I think they shockingly pulled it off as a remake because it doesn't take itself too seriously, and they're experimenting with some really cool tactics with the action. So it's dumb fun, can't hurt to turn it on, but this worked out really well because my top 10 are all films that I really would recommend seeking out. So without further ado, let's talk about some motion pictures. At number 10 is The Greatest Hits. This is a sci-fi rom-com that was kind of flying under the radar until recently because it's dropping on Hulu on April 12th and has our new Superman David Corn Sweat and Lucy Boynton who is in Sing Street, great film better rom-com than this one in my opinion. But I liked this movie. I thought it was good. The concept is very unique. Her boyfriend has passed and every time she hears a song that they shared, she gets like transported through time to the moment that they heard it. From the romantic perspective though, it's got a good sense of humor for sure, but it's also more mushy gushy and melodramatic in a way that just is personally not quite my thing. I'm not much of a romantic, but if that sounds like it's your thing, you'll eat it up. So Hulu release, check it out. At number nine, I have My Dead friend Zoe. This is a heavy film that actually has a really cool backstory. It was co-written and directed by Kyle Hausman Stokes, who was an active duty paratrooper, but was actually encouraged to leave the military so that he could make films. And now here he is with a deeply personal film that's inspired not only by his own story, but stories of a lot of veterans. We noticed there was kind of this trend at the fest this year of films trying to do a tonal balance of humor and some really heavy subject matter. And I thought that my dead friend Zoe was one of the ones that executed that better. The performances are very charismatic. Sinequa Martin-Green, Natalie Morales, Ed Harris. And it's not afraid to laugh, but it also pays ample attention to the really important messaging about the risk of PTSD and suicide in veterans. And depending on how suicide is depicted, it can be a tough thing for me personally to see in films. And this one really got to me. So big trigger warning, especially if you're a veteran. And I can't say I agree with every way that they handled the subject matter, but it was very effective. Like everyone in the theater was crying. Very promising directorial debut from Kyle Hausman Stokes. I'd be really curious to see if he kind of stays with this subject matter as he moves forward or if he dives into different territory. At number eight, I have a nice Indian boy. Now I'm going to look like a hypocrite because this is also a very wholesome rom-com and it made me cry like four times. It was directed by Rashan Seti and adapted from a play actually, but Karen Sony plays a guy who comes from a traditional Indian family, but he's gay. So there's not only some discomfort around that, but then he brings home Jonathan Groff, who is white. And even though he was raised uh, by adopted Indian parents, it's still a kind of rough merging of families. I just love films like that, that deal with the real world, very sobering sides of relationships and the way that the two leads and, and this family, and especially the sister learn to understand and accept each other. It's just really beautiful. Like there's some really beautiful moments in this film. And though I don't think it's perfect from a script or a technical perspective, man, it just lands all its emotional notes. And it's also super funny, like successfully funny in a very modern sort of way, but also infused with Bollywood nostalgia. So I highly recommend this. I heard a lot of sniffling throughout the theater. I couldn't find actual release info, but I'm praying 
that it's gonna be in theaters or on streaming because it's a movie that deserves to be seen. Number seven is The Fall Guy. Another sweet poster. David Leach and I have a weird relationship. I always give his films decent ratings and it feels wrong. <laughs> like Bullet Train, I gave that a 3.5 and I look at it and I'm like, there's no way that movie is good. And yet I had a good time. I gave Fall Guy the same rating even though it has major issues. It's convoluted, the romance isn't as good as it should be, it focuses on all the wrong things. And yet it's got true star power. Ryan Gosling and Emily Blunt are just painfully charismatic and it got my sweet spot of at its core being a love letter to the often thankless stunt crews that make some of our favorite movie moments happen. They also set a really cool Guinness World Record while they were filming of doing a stunt in which a car does eight and a half cannon rolls. And it's gonna be a smash hit, don't get me wrong, like it's funny, it's entertaining, I'll just take John Wick over it any day. <laughs> Number six is Civil War, the big kahuna. We got a taste of this discourse when the first reactions came out and it was already a lot. <laughs> Once it gets its wide release on April 12th, I might have to like delete Twitter. It's from Alex Garland who has written a lot of great stuff but has written and directed Annihilation, Ex Machina, and most recently Men, a film that I really didn't enjoy. So he's on thin ice with a lot of people right now as it is and based on the trailer you might think when I say discourse that I mean specific political discourse but it's very much not the movie that the trailer sells it as. It's really a very sobering movie about war photographers kind of in this like Dante's Inferno road trip style and I think the conversation is going to be around Alex Alex Garland's decision to not make it very concerned with American politics. And that's all I'll say. I found his approach in some ways really profound and unique and in others kind of hollow. So some people are gonna think it's cowardly. Some people are gonna think it's a masterpiece. I can personally really see all perspectives and at, at times I felt those different things watching the movie. And that's why I fell somewhere closer to the middle, but I still really liked it. And I'm excited to read others thoughts on this when it comes out. It's also a very loud and intense movie. So IMAX is recommended. We're in the top five now in my number five slot is Asriel. Maybe the most fantastic fest film of South by Southwest. It's a no dialogue, biblical horror film with an action twist and Samara weaving as the lead from the guy behind your next. No, you're not dreaming. This movie kind of rips, guys. It grows on me the more I think about it because it slowly became like more badass as it went on. And at the end, I was like, I feel like this was pretty much made for me. And the no dialogue gimmick has been very present lately. We saw it in No One Will Save You and John Woo's Silent Night, and in both of those, I wasn't really sold on it, but here it has not only a really cool narrative religious purpose in this sort of post-apocalyptic wasteland, but if you're gonna do no dialogue, you need someone as charismatic and expressive as Samara Weaving in the lead role. Like she could be a silent film star. She's so fun to watch in this. The horror elements rock, the biblical elements are delicious. The action was a fun surprise. This is one that was just very much my thing. So I'll probably rate it a little bit higher than the average person, but I think I think they nailed it and it's just a really fun movie. At number four, we have Ghost Light. This one got a lot of buzz at Sundance, but I sadly wasn't able to see it. And I get it now that I caught it at South by Southwest. I mean, wow, it's just a really, solid movie, another heavy one for sure, that hits on all its emotional beats because it's a very vulnerable film and so much of that is felt through the performances, particularly Keith Kupfer as the lead, but also who are, I guess, his real life daughter, Catherine, and his wife, Tara Mallon. They play a real family in this as they're processing grief. And the way that he starts to do that is by joining a community theater doing Romeo and Juliet. And the way that that play mirrors his own life and what happens to them is slowly revealed throughout the film. It's a really, really neat idea. It's it's really beautiful. I, I love films that discuss how we can process trauma through art. There were some aspects of that that I felt were a little unbelievable, but it's really the only issue that I had with this film. It is a must watch when it comes out. At number three, is Babes. Now, I have not talked a lot about this film on my social media. I'm going to eventually one of the best movies of the festival, one of the, like, my favorite female-led comedies in recent years. There are no theatrical plans for it yet. Get it together, Neon. But I watched a lot of Broad City in college. That was where I discovered how riotously hilarious Alana Glazer is. 
I could watch her do anything. Like, she just ex exudes that full frontal approach to life and everything that she does. And Michelle Buteau is every part her equal here. They play best friends who are navigating growing up and starting families and how that changes their friendship. So there's a really great, like, emotional side of this. But there are also so many great bits here. It's, it's like a raunchy comedy that doesn't feel like it's trying too hard. It really reminded me of Bridesmaids. Good comedies, especially female-led, are just so scarce these days. I was like over the moon. People said that they could like hear me laughing in the theater. I loved it. It just feels so classic. I would like to watch it a million times. And you all should too. Neon, get to work. And number two, here it is. Monkey Man. This will likely be my first full-length review that I do out of the fest, so I'll come back and tag it. But man, it just feels good when you are like this excited for a movie and it delivers on this level. Dev Patel received a standing ovation for it afterwards and I cried like it was a really powerful moment to be a part of in that theater. Everyone clearly loved it. It was so apparent that the cast and crew just put blood, sweat and tears into this. So we'll talk about it, but it really is so good. And, and I'll say like, expect something that's a little rough around the edges. But to me, that was what made it so exciting exciting and feel so alive. Like, I think this is a big moment in the action genre and you're not gonna wanna miss it when it comes out. It's gonna be out on April 5th. But number one, and this one was always gonna have my top spot because I had already seen it at Sundance and I knew that it wouldn't be beat. Jane Schoenbrunn's I Saw the TV Glow. On our podcast episode about South by Southwest, Joe told me I couldn't rank this as my number one for both this and Sundance, but you bet your ass I am because it really is that good. I think it's a master piece I officially slapped it with the five stars and I'm afraid to see what the world does with it once it gets a wide release but so many people are gonna relate to it even more than me as a queer film and just love the hell out of it. I just think Jane Schoenbrunn is a genius. I've never seen a film like this in my life. The performances are so moving. The soundtrack rocks. It just came out like a week or two ago. Good movie. I don't see it being knocked out of my top like three of the year. But there you have it. That is my ranking of the 10 best films that I watched at my first South by Southwest. I also watched a short documentary about dog massaging. It was interesting. The dogs were very cute. If you stayed this long, I appreciate you. Let me know what you're looking forward to on on this list. And while many reviews are coming, I'm also gonna get cooking on this 10K subs video. I just really am so grateful for you guys. I'm so lucky that I get to do this and, and do the podcast and travel around the country to watch movies. So keep an eye out for that. I love you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you for supporting, for watching. If you're new here, don't forget to subscribe and keep an eye out for more videos soon. Thanks for watching.